lecture is brought to you by the virtual campus of the Reformed Baptist Seminary. For information on other courses or seminary programs, please contact us at info at rbseminary.org or go to our website, rbseminary.org. Day two. Oh, no. Good morning. We're back for day two now in our uh, study introduction to biblical counseling and this morning we're in lecture number six uh, talking about the cross. We've looked at the heat and the thorns. This, this lecture, this session, we'll be in talking of the cross and the following we'll talk about new and surprising fruit. But the focus here is because of the cross of Jesus we have new identity and we have new potential. So quickly in reviewing, we've talked about this three trees diagram uh, and we need to begin by asking the question, what's the heat in your life? What's the situation? How is that bringing pressure to bear on your life? Uh, you remember heat includes both trials and blessings uh, because both impact our lives and elicit some kind of a response from us. So what is that heat? Uh, but then after that, we look at the three trees, the thorns, the cross, and the fruit. And so at the thorn bush, we ask the question, uh, how are you responding to that heat, uh, particularly are you responding in thorny or more sinful ways? And if that's the case, then we have to go back and ask, well, what's the root? What uh, are you treasuring in your heart? What are you believing and what are you seeking? What are the desires and expectations that are contributing to that thorny response that are driving your heart? Um, but these are the kind of questions that are going to help us uh, understand and identify what it is that's entangling us and producing bad fruit. So the second tree what we'll be looking at this morning is the cross. And we ask the question here, who is God? And what does He say and what does He do for us in Christ? And the cross is about more than simply forgiveness of sins and entry into heaven. It's certainly that. Uh, but it encompasses the entire work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, both past and present and future. So we understand the past, forgiveness of sin, we understand the future, admittance into heaven. But what about the present? What is Jesus doing now in our lives? What is He enabling us to do right now? And the way you answer that question is going to powerfully shape your functional identity. Very important term. What is my functional identity? How do I view myself uh, and how, what does that mean for what I believe that I'm capable of doing. So uh, a big focus of our, uh, of our time this morning in this, this first session is this question, what is my identity? Uh, have you ever asked, heard someone excuse their, their blows up of, blow ups of anger or maybe a lack of compassion or some other besetting habitual sin and they say, that's just who I am. Now when someone says that's just who I am, they're making an identity statement. That is what I believe about myself. And the reality is we always live out of a sense of identity. Who I believe I am powerfully influences the way I live, what I believe that I can do, my potential, how I respond to the heat in my life. Uh, we live out of our sense of identity. This is who I am. This is, this is the way I function. And so Christ living in me is really an essential identity statement. So the big question, what are some specific ways you are failing to let the cross shape your situations and relationships? What would change in these areas if you lived in a more cross-centered way? So We've said before, the gospel is more than simply a system of redemption. We have a redeemer, a relationship with Jesus Christ, and the cross points to a vital, empowering relationship with the Lord Jesus. So we need to ask, what situations in my life need to be influenced more powerfully by my relationship with Jesus, by the cross of Christ? What relationships and what situations need to be shaped by the reality of Jesus Christ at work in my life? What would change if that was a practical reality? So here's another question that, that we really ask. We ask this all the time and we're not even aware of it, right? Do I have what it takes? How many times have you found yourself asking yourself that question? You, you, you're, you're facing some sort of challenge and consciously or unconsciously you're asking the question, do I have what it takes to meet this challenge? 
Another way of saying this is we're always measuring our potential. You can observe this in a, in a toddler who's just learning to walk, and he's, he's standing there holding onto this chair, and he's looking at the coffee table about six or seven steps away and asking, do I have what it takes to get from here to there without falling on my nose, right? And we, if you're a student and you, you're facing a, a test or a, a, a paper or some other assignment, you're asking, do I have what it takes to complete this assignment? If you're, um, uh, if you're doing an assignment at work, do I have what it takes to accomplish this assignment? Now, it may be the answer is, well, of course, I've done it a billion times. But even when you're confident that you have what it takes, you're still assessing your potential. Uh, if there's a home repair job, a, 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 a car repair job, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm saying, do I have what it takes? And I'm like, no, I don't. Go to YouTube and find out, right? Uh, but this is true for little children, it's true for adults. We're always measuring our potential and asking the question, can I do this? Do I have what it takes? And if, you, if the answer is yes, I believe I do have what it takes, I believe I can do this, you proceed with confidence. And if you don't believe that you can successfully address the challenge, you might not even try. I mean, why keep beating your head against a brick wall, right? So you, in fact, you may not even allow yourself to want to accomplish that goal. If I allow myself to want it, that just means I'm setting myself up for disappointment. So what's the point, right? So I asked earlier at that root of the thorny responses, what do I believe and what do I want? If you believe that you have what it takes to see real and lasting change in your life, if you recognize your potential in Jesus Christ, you're more likely to set your heart on change. If you don't believe that you can really do anything about it, then you're likely to settle in and not even try. So what we believe our potential is, our identity is, powerfully shapes what we attempt. It shapes what we even allow ourselves to desire. And that's an important insight into the human psyche. So there are reasons that we answer the question, yes, of course I've got what it takes. Some reasons for self-confidence, ways we measure our potential. Uh, you, one could be your family background. You have good role models in your life. Uh, you've been well-trained at home. Uh, or possibly you have a, a really solid educational and training background, and so you feel competent in whatever you're addressing. Uh, you're confident in the gifts and abilities that God has entrusted to you. This is something I can do. It's in my wheelhouse, so to speak. Or you've simply learned some lessons over time. Uh, I know I didn't have what it takes, but I've been down, uh, you know, this is my, not my first rodeo. Been around the block a few times. Now I feel I can address this situation with a, a, a bit more confidence. And maybe you can simply look at a string of past, past successes and say, yeah, I got this. All right. But these are things that we consider when we're measuring our potential. And these contribute to a sense of confidence as we attempt to track, tackle new challenges. Now, as Christians, particularly as Reformed Christians, we know God is sovereign over each of these influences. God is in control of whether or not I have any of those benefits in my life. And He uses these things to prepare us for the things He wants us to do. If you think about what Moses was called to do, he had the finest education Egypt had to offer. Or the Apostle Paul had the finest theological education that was available in his day, albeit under a Jewish context. But all of that was pre-conversion, pre-calling, preparatory to the work to which God had called those men to do. So we can be thankful when we have these kind of assets or these kind of benefits, but they're not essential. In fact, sometimes human reason for self-confidence is not only inadequate, it can even get in the way. And so if you feel like, well, I have a deficit in any one of these areas, that is no reason to say, why even try? Think of some of the servants of God who lacked self-confidence. Gideon, when the angel of the Lord came to him, he said, I'm, my, my family is the weakest and I'm the weakest in my family. Uh, or the disciples, they didn't have any formal education. They didn't have degrees. They had three, three years with Jesus, though. Moses, I don't speak very well. I have a speech impediment. Uh, Jeremiah, Lord, I'm only a, a youth. I can't do what you're asking me to do. 
Peter, he denied Jesus three times. He was a colossal failure. So God delights in using us in spite of our sense of inadequacy. You may not feel like you have sufficient upbringing or training. You may not feel like you have eminent gifts or experience or success. How can a Christian face new challenges today in areas where we failed yesterday? Well, in the very areas where we failed, that's where God enables us and calls us to bring forth new and wonderful fruit. How's that possible? How can we approach the heat with renewed hope and renewed confidence when we haven't done so well in the past? Whether it's the family or it's your education or your talent, your experiences, success, all those things have value, they're blessings, but those miss the core reason which we should have confidence as our potential as children of God. All right? In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter writes, His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He granted us to us His precious and very great promises so that through them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desires. Total side note, Greek professors love this text because of all the prepositions. Uh, and if you look at all those prepositions, they add powerful meaning as you interpret this text. But this isn't a grammar lesson. Uh, Peter says that we have everything that we need for life and godliness. And these verses ex or reveal to us what our true identity is and what our potential is as a result. These are more than human advantages. In fact, self-confidence can get in the way of our conscious dependence on the Lord Jesus. So the question, who are you? I am a partaker of the divine nature. I am being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. What is your potential? Well, I have all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's a fruit of my union with the Lord Jesus. I have His divine power at work in me. Now, in ourselves, we are truly weaker than we realize. Let me say that again. In ourselves, we are weaker than we realize. And if we, you know, run through life with all this bluster and self-confidence, we're going to fall on our faces, right? When we feel our weaknesses, that's actually a good thing because it forces us to put our dependence on Christ. Paul says, when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. So what is our potential? Well, Peter tells us we have all that we need to live a godly life. All the resources necessary are readily available to the child of God. So asking the question, what do you want? What do you believe? Well, we need to replace the false beliefs that lead to a thorny response with God's very, or His precious and very great promises. What do you want? We need to replace our selfish desires with desires for the glory of God. Believing that God can even use such as you and such as I. Philippians 4.13, we've talked about this briefly, uh, where Paul in prison is talking about contentment, and he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, Paul had all manner of reason <coughs> for self-confidence. He was, had the highest training available in his day. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews and all those things. He was eminently gifted, and he had a string of successes. But the reality is the trials that Paul experienced were beyond his human resources. So his confidence was not in himself. His confidence was in the Lord Jesus who gives him strength. And again, the context for this declaration, this is, this is a general principle of Christian living that is spoken in a particular context, that is the need for contentment. But this is a general principle that applies across the Christian life. All right? But it doesn't mean you can set any goal that you want and you have the ability to meet that goal. It doesn't mean you can accomplish anything you set your mind to. That's the message we get when we see these elite athletes who succeed and say that proves that you can do anything you want. No, it doesn't. An elite athlete, if he works hard enough, can be elite. But I can't be an elite athlete. It ain't going to happen. All right? Doesn't matter how much I want it or how hard I try. Paul is not dealing with personal goals here. He's not dealing with his own 
personal ambition. He's in prison. He's describing how he learned the secret of being content in prison. It's not talking about the ability to do what you want to do. In fact, it's talking about the ability to do the things you, you really don't want to do. <laughs> I don't want to be content here. I want to get out. And Paul says, no, I've learned to be content. I'm okay. I'm okay here in prison. I've learned the secret of being content. How is that possible, Paul? Because I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So think about the all things. Can God do all things? We, we actually mentioned this yesterday. The children's catechism answers that, asks that question. And the answer is yes, God can do all his holy will. And I said yesterday, he cannot contradict himself by making a, a rock so big that even he can't move it. He cannot sin, he cannot change, he cannot be foolish, but God can do all His holy will. And in the same way, what does it mean that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength? It doesn't mean I can leap tall buildings in a single bound or run faster than a speeding bullet. That's that Superman reference. It means that by His grace, with His strength, I can do all God's holy will for me. That doesn't mean I can do all God's holy will for you. It means that you can do what God would, has called you to do, and by His grace, I can do what God has called me to do. You can overcome thorny responses. You can overcome deeply rooted sin habits because you know God wants you to do that. You can learn to want the Lord Jesus more than you want your own pleasures and your own comforts. What do I want? What do I believe? We can learn, we can grow to have new desires for Christ. We can learn to believe His promises more than we believe our own fears, our own limitations, our own anxieties, and certainly the lies of the enemy. We can learn to believe things that right now we're having a hard time wrapping our hands around. There is a, a, a discipline in, in, uh, in psychology called cognitive behavior therapy. And CBT focuses on what they call cognitive distortions. What that is simply distorted thinking, self-defeating thought patterns, such as uh, labeling. I have failed at something, therefore I label myself as a failure. Uh, no, you're a person who failed, but that doesn't mean you're bound to fail the next time. But a cognitive distortion says, I am stuck in failure. Or, um, or there's catastrophization. Uh, oh, this is the worst thing that has ever happened in all of human history. And you're blowing things out of proportion. Those are cognitive distortions. And they reveal the fact that we're all interpreters. We place an interpretation on the events or the heat of our lives. And these false interpretations set us up for failure and defeat. So far, CBT gets it right. They rightly diagnose a very real problem in the human heart. However, sometimes the solutions they offer fall short. Basically, what they do is they say, well, here's what you're believing that's not true, this distorted thinking. Here's what you ought to believe. And the what you ought to believe is generally they're, they're replacing a harmful lie with a less harmful lie. <laughs> Rather than going to the glorious truth of the gospel and saying it's so much better than you could ever imagine. And so we can learn from CBT. I, I would encourage you, get online and, 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 and do a search for, uh, our, for uh, cognitive distortions. And you'll get these lists. And sometimes it's a list of a dozen. Sometimes it's a list of 50. But read that list and see, you know, people really do wrestle with some of those things. I wrestle with some of those things. What is the biblical response to each of those distorted points of view or those distorted perceptions or those distorted interpretations? How does God's Word straighten out our distortive thinking? Well, one of the things that God uses is His precious and very great promises to help us look at life differently. What's my potential? My potential is Jesus Christ dwelling in me. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. This is not some mystical let go and let God kind of principle. It's simply a powerful statement about our identity and our potential. Paul writing to the Galatian churches is addressing a distortion and a confusion about the gospel. 
So I want us to look at this verse, this, this very important, powerful statement, and how it shapes our understanding of the cross and of redemption. Now again, the cross addresses our past, how we are forgiven of our sins and accepted by God. But Paul's not really addressing justification in this immediate context. The cross also is the means by which we gain entry into heaven. But Paul, again, is not primarily focusing on our future in this verse. He has been talking about justification by grace through work, rather than through works of the law. But now he's talking about something more. He's actually talking about our present situation, our present experience. Because the cross speaks to the heat in our lives and how we respond to it. So Paul's talking about a present reality. The cross fundamentally changes who we are and what we believe about ourselves and what we believe we're able to do. It changes our sense of identity and our sense of potential. Three things that we need to understand, that we need to recognize in this area. One is this redemptive fact, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Now again, this is not... Uh, some kind of a mystical uh, let go and let God sort of thing. It's simply this reality that when Jesus was crucified, uh, we are united with him in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He died physically, but you and I died spiritually. And we're risen to walk in newness of life. We're fundamentally united with him in his death. What does that mean? Well, it means we were born under the dominion of sin because we're sinners. Now, again, this is an important distinction. Do I sin because I'm a sinner or am I a sinner because I sin? The answer is A. I sin because that's my nature. I'm a sinner. My sin doesn't make me a sinner. My sin reveals the fact that I am a sinner. That was our natural identity. That's our potential. My natural potential is falling short of the glory of God. But Jesus' death conquered the power of sin and death for us and our union with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection sets us free from the bondage to sin. That's what it means that I've been crucified with Christ, I no longer live. That's the redemptive fact. The word crucified is in past tense, by the way. Uh, it, it, it's, it's actually it's a perfect tense, excuse me, which means it's an accomplished fact. It happened in the past, but the, but the results continue. That's kind of a technical way of, of understanding that Greek tense here. But I have been crucified, and that is my continuing status. It's a transaction that's complete, and the effects of that transaction continue to today. Now, when it says, I no longer live, well, what is Paul saying here? Well, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. All things are made new. What you once were, you are no longer in that sense, in bondage to sin, in slavery to the enemy. The sin that once defined you, that dominated your life, is no longer your master. Jesus broke the power of sin, and he set you free. There is a fundamental constitutional change that takes place when we are regenerated, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, when we are made new. And so now, we have the potential to live in radically different ways, even in the same old circumstances of life. In that sense, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. So the heat doesn't necessarily have to change because you've changed. Your identity, crucified with Christ, you no longer live. Christ lives in you. You have a new identity because you're united with Christ. But that's not the only thing here. There's a present reality. Christ now lives in me. Your heart was under the dominion of sin, but now Jesus dwells in your heart. He gives new strength, new grace, wisdom, love, and because Jesus lives in you, you can practically change those places where you feel stuck. The awareness that you are in Christ gives you new potential, new hope, new identity, new confidence. You can take on a new challenge and not settle for the same old thorny responses that character, characterize your life maybe for years. So what is my potential? It is Christ living in me. That's my present reality. And thirdly, the results of this, the life I now live, 
in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Again, this verse can sound kind of mystical, and the mystics love to take this verse and run with it in places that I don't believe that God intended, but it has powerful, practical implications. Paul is not saying we cease to have personal responsibility. Jesus simply does it all for us as we sit back and relax. That Jesus fights your battle, and you can simply live the Christian life passively. I don't believe that at all. Paul didn't believe that. But because Jesus is living in us, we can be active. We can take bold initiative. I like that phrase. We can take bold initiative. We can respond by faith in new ways to the same old heat. And the way we do that is by faith, not because we feel necessarily any different at all. It'd be wonderful if we felt different. And sometimes we will, but many times we might feel the same, but that doesn't change the reality of what Christ has done and is doing in us. There are two reasons that we can trust Jesus in this text. One is because He loves us. And number two is because He gave Himself for us. Why did He go to the cross? Because He loves us. He is for you. He is committed to complete the work that He began in you. The life I am I live, that's present tense, the life I'm now living in the flesh. I am living by faith. That sounds really good. What does it mean to to, to live by faith in Christ who is living in you? What does that actually look like? How does He empower me? What can I expect to happen because Christ is living in me? How is that going to make a real difference in my life? Well, first of all, it's not this, all right? How many of y'all remember Popeye? Remember? You know, Popeye has this, 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 this uh, his nemesis is a big old muscular guy named Bluto. And Popeye and Bluto are fighting over olive oil, the girl, his girlfriend, Popeye's girlfriend. And Bluto starts beating the living daylights out of Popeye. And somehow he gets hold of a can of spinach, he squeezes it, and the lid comes off, and the stream of spinach flows into his mouth, and suddenly he is empowered with new energy, and he knows he can take Bluto on, and he rinds his arm up and you know, hits Bluto and he flies off into the next county. Don't expect that kind of feeling to happen in your life. Uh, we have a distorted expectation that somehow the Christian life becomes effortless. All right? Christ living in me does not make the Christian life easy. It makes the Christian life possible. Let me say that again. Christ living in me does not make the Christian life easy. It makes the Christian life possible. I am able to do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I still have to choose to trust Him and obey Him. But Jesus gives me the strength that I would not have otherwise to do the things that He is calling me to do. I have, because I'm united with Christ, I have a new identity, I have a new potential. And if you measure your potential Based on your union with Jesus Christ, just think for a minute, what impact is that going to have? It's not going to make you Popeye, and it's not going to make you Superman. But if you believe, truly believe, that Jesus will enable you to do whatever God is calling you to do, it's going to make a difference. There are three areas of important gospel fruit that really should result from this new awareness. All right. First of all, what does it look like? It looks like living with personal integrity. It looks like creating a climate of grace in our relationships. And it looks like acting with courageous grace and constructive truth. We're going to break these down for just a minute, okay? First of all, living with personal integrity means we're ready to examine ourselves in the mirror of God's Word. And again, as Pastor Mark said yesterday, sometimes as men particularly, we don't want to see that. I don't want to see stuff that I need to work on because then I got to admit that I'm wrong and then I got to do something about it, right? But this, this living with integrity means that we're willing to live with a genuine biblical self-awareness. We're not going to hide from what we discover, We're not going to avoid dealing with what we find when we look in the mirror of God's Word because the thorns are not our identity any longer. We are no longer stuck. 
I think in Pilgrim's Progress of those poor, despairing souls Pilgrim sees, and they're sitting inside of a cage, but the cage is open. The door is open, and they don't seem to realize it, and they're still stuck, even though the door's open. All right? We don't need to be there any longer. We can live with a confidence that we have the ability in Christ to change. We can overcome long-standing sin habits, both in our thoughts and in our attitudes and what we want and what we believe in our private life and our relationships. We have the ability to examine and see what's wrong and do something about it, all right? We'll recognize also that change is a community project. And we talked about this yesterday. We're not going to try to go it alone. I don't have to be me and Jesus. I can lean on a brother or sister. I can solicit the help of another to come alongside. We become keenly aware God did not design us to go it alone and show us that we really do truly need brothers and sisters in Christ. We'll be thankful for their partnership in the gospel. And you see Paul expressing that in his writings. We'll, we're willing to come alongside others, bear their burdens, but also let them bear our burdens, which means we have to let them know what those burdens are. We'll be honest about our own struggles. We'll come out of hiding. We can be secure who we are in Christ, that His grace is sufficient, so we can be humble and honest about our own struggles. We can express appropriate emotions Real men don't cry. Well, godly men do. <laughs> or we should when, we, when it's appropriate. Uh, we're willing to express when we're afraid or when we're sorrowful or when we're grieving or when we're frustrated, even when we're angry. There's a place to say, you know, this really this, this makes me angry and, and maybe it shouldn't or maybe I'm not dealing with it rightly. Uh, and we can be honest with that. And as we express these things appropriately, we can move toward one another and we can begin to see real changes take place. As recipients of grace, we'll also create a climate of grace in our relationships. That means that we're going to forgive as we have been forgiven. And if you're truly living by faith in Jesus every single day, you're going to be keenly aware of God's grace to you in Christ. And you will become more and more aware of your need for His grace and more willing to extend that grace to other people, which means you will be merciful with people who need mercy who fail you, who sin, who irritate you. Uh, we will be ready to ask forgiveness. We're not going to make excuses or blame shift. We're not going to try to justify ourselves. We don't have to keep up appearances anymore. We can be honest, come out of hiding. I don't have to be right all the time. How many, how many arguments do we get into because somebody just has to be right? Whether they are or not, it doesn't really matter. I can admit uh, that I fail. I can admit that I struggle. I can admit that I sin. Wait a minute, pastor's not supposed to sin. At least they're not supposed to admit it. Well, you know, I, I, I tell parents, your kids know that you sin. The question is, do they know you're humble enough to admit it and confess it and seek their forgiveness? We can do that if we know Christ is living in us. We'll, be seek, we'll, we'll, we'll seek and we'll give, or excuse me, we'll seek to give and to serve in tangible ways. Uh, the gifts God has entrusted in you. Christ living in you, you will incorporate, you will exercise those gifts for the benefit of other people, which means you're going to be free of self-consciousness. You don't feel like you need to impress anybody. Uh, you don't need to be self-conscious that maybe somebody can do it better than you. If God puts the opportunity to before you, then you step out and you can do it without taking thought to yourself. A holy self-forgetfulness in that sense. All right? And then we will persevere when we're tempted to give up. Christ living in me does not make the Christian life easy. It makes it possible. You're still going to get frustrated. We still get discouraged. We still feel defeated. And sometimes real sincere Christians, Christ living in us, we share his man of sorrow identity and we get depressed. It happens. But our new identity, our new potential enables us to persevere when before we would have lost heart. All right. But thirdly, we'll act with courageous grace and constructive truth. We can speak the truth with one another in love, even when it's not easy. We're willing to challenge others when it's necessary, but we can do so graciously and lovingly. Have you ever had somebody come alongside and challenge you, and you felt like they have just blessed you in some enormous way? And it's like, wait a minute, you just called out my sin, but I feel better about it. How is that? Because they did so with mercy and kindness. 
and they showed you the way out. It's not that they condemned you. They helped you see your identity in Christ. You don't have to be this way anymore. All right? So we can be gracious and loving. We can also be fearless. I don't have to get the upper hand. I don't have to uh, get my own way. I don't have to pursue my own agenda. I can pursue the glory of Jesus Christ, and I can build others up. We'll speak the truth in love. We'll, sh- we'll shape our responses by Jesus' will rather than my own agenda. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. I, I can embrace Jesus' agenda for my life and from, rather than my own agenda. And I can pursue His agenda not only in my own life, but in your life as well. All right? I don't have to live to please or get the approval of other people. Because there are going to be people who will not understand if you're doing what God would have you do. My self-will, my fears, my own desires for comfort will not determine how I respond to the heat in my life. I can believe the truth, and I can live it out in practical ways. God's grace enables us to do those things. All right? We'll confront old habit patterns of belief with new confidence in the truth. Most Christians have settled into a sense of identity and potential that doesn't fully incorporate these gospel realities. We have a functional theology that falls short of who we truly are in Jesus Christ, of our professed theology. We don't view ourselves as Christ living in us with all of the power that brings along with that reality. And so we see a challenge that God truly wants us to take up, and we say, how am I supposed to do that? Because the reality is we feel like life is bigger than we are. In your own resources, you're right, that's true, it is. But we don't live out of our own limited resources any longer. We have unlimited potential of Christ living in us. That doesn't mean you're Superman or Popeye. It simply means that you are able to bring forth new and surprisingly good fruit. So what's your functional identity? We've talked about our identity in Christ, that our in Galatians 2:20, that that Christ, that is our identity. Christ lives in me. Philippians 4 13, we talked about our potential. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. But we don't always live this way. Uh, We have a functional theology that is more about what we feel than what we know. Uh, Our functional identity is how I feel about myself. We might call that a self-image. And we live out of that functional identity, even though we're not really aware of it. All right, But there are assumptions that typically define each of us. Who are you? What's your essential identity? What do you like? What's your personality? Uh, What are you capable of doing that speak to your potential? What is your worth or your value? What are you entitled to and what are you not? All right. Now, you may not consciously be aware of how you answer any of those questions. You, You just think that way without even thinking about it. But we live out of that sense of identity, those four issues. And who you believe you are powerfully shapes how you live and how you respond to the heat in your life. A cross-centered perspective, define yourself in terms of what Jesus' life and His death and His resurrection is making you to be. So we need to understand more about this cross-centered perspective. The key is our identity in Christ. But how this identity frees us to live a life of daily repentance. There's this confusion that Jesus paid the penalty of my sins in the past, it secures me for entrance in heaven in the future, but it now is up to me to really follow His example and, and we see this, uh, there are numerous passages in Scripture that call us to personal effort. And we can take those passages in isolation and miss the overall context of the gospel and become uh, very driven, like it's all up to me. Uh, Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, do you not know that uh, in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable so I don't run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after, lest after preaching to others I myself might be disqualified. And so we get the sense there that it's all up to me. Or in 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, train yourselves for godliness while bodily training is of some value. Godliness is of value of every way as it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. Or 2 Peter 1, 5 and 7, speaking about our potential 
And he says, because of uh, these very great promises and who we are in Christ, and then we have all that we need for life and godliness, he says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, and so forth. But it's make every effort as if it were all up to you without going back to the context that talks about our potential and our identity in Jesus Christ. And it's, it, it, again, it's this misperception that it's up to me to make myself godly. Hebrews chapter 12, 14, strive with peace for, for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If you're not holy, you won't see the Lord. And we can look at that and say, it's up to me to make myself holy, rather than rec- recognizing that that is the fruit of Christ at work in us. So justification is an act of God's free grace, where He pardons all our sins, He accepts us as righteous in His sight, only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, and received by faith alone. God does the work. It's called monergistic, one person doing the work. But what's sanctification? Sanctification is the work now, justification is an act. Sanctification is a work. And, and the reason the, the, the writer said that that way is an act is once and all completed. Work is ongoing. That actually is a distinction. But continuing to go, it's a work of God's free grace where we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God. That's what God does. And we are enabled more and more to die into sin and to live in righteousness. So there's something God has done. He has renewed us and He has enabled us. But there's something that we need to do as a result, die to sin, live to righteousness. We have work to do, but we are not the initiators. We're the responders. Sanctification is not monergistic. God does it all. And it's not monergistic. You do it all. It's synergistic. God has done this glorious, marvelous work for us and in us. And as a response, this is what we are able to do. Now get busy and do it. We have the ability to buffet our bodies, to pursue holiness, to add to our faith virtue, and so forth. And when we lose sight of that dynamic, we get off course. There's a man named Joe. Joe was a new Christian. He'd been a Christian about three years. And for the first three years of his Christian life, he was very disciplined. Every day had a quiet time. No Bible, no breakfast, and that whole thing. And people just marveled at his discipline. And he was witnessing to people, and he never missed church. He was just a picture of a fruitful, faithful Christian. Joe also had a bit of an attitude, because he looked at other people and was like, well, I'm doing this, what's their problem? A little bit just, a little bit proud, okay? And then something happened. Somewhere along the way, he he missed a quiet time, and then he missed another, and he started feeling guilty about it. And then he started getting discouraged. He, He lost his zeal. The Bible became dull to him. It became uninteresting. He found it hard to concentrate in prayer. And he just began to drift. And his friends are watching this and they're thinking, Joe's just become lazy. But the reality is the problem started way before that. Because his confidence was not in Jesus Christ. His confidence was not in the cross. His confidence was in Joe. And Joe didn't have what it takes inside of Joe to sustain that persevering heart. He had grown proud. He had grown self-sufficient. He had grown critical of other people. Jesus got me through the door, but it's up to me to do the rest. And his functional identity was, it's up to me and I can do it. And then when he discovered he couldn't do it, it fell apart. All right? He lost his way. He hit the wall. And he feels like an utter failure because he can't keep it up. All right? We minimize the work of Christ and we rely on our own efforts. When we do that, this Christless activism in some people produces pride and self-sufficiency. But in others, a Christless passivity produces guilt and depression and susceptibility to temptation. There are some people who have a strong internal fortitude, and so we take the Nike approach, just do it, and it seems to work for a while. They're particularly disciplined, and and they seem to do fine. Others here just do it, and it just makes them more discouraged. And the disciplined Christians look at the others and say, why can't they just do it, right? Right? And the discouraged Christian is asking himself the same question. But they're both an expression of Christless daily living. But the cross gives us a new identity. This cross-centered identity says, I don't have to perform. I don't have to keep up appearances. I don't have to hide in shame. I can look to Christ. I can honestly confess my sin. I can practice daily repentance. Jesus is at work in me. 
He will complete the work. And though I'm weak, I can honestly deal with my sin, find grace, and move forward. So repentance and faith, they're ongoing necessities in the Christian life. And uh, as Martin Luther, I believe, that said, uh, every day for the Christian is repentance. And they're inseparable. They're like two sides of the same coin. It doesn't have to be hard to admit that you're wrong and ask forgiveness if you know who you are in Christ. It doesn't have to be difficult because uh, I heard this when I was in in, in high school. God doesn't want to hurt your pride. He wants to kill it. (laughs) Uh, He wants to replace it with a robust humility and confidence in Him. See, my functional identity says, I've got this image I've got to keep up. But if my identity is, I am in Christ and He is for me, then I can deal honestly with the sin. I don't have to keep up this appearance. My identity is not threatened. My world doesn't fall apart when I fail because I know who I am in Christ. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. What do you need to know in order to freely confess your sin? Well, it's that Jesus is faithful and just. He will forgive. He will cleanse. Faithful emphasizes the fact that He promised He would forgive you, He would receive you, and He would cleanse you. Just emphasizes that He paid the debt, which is the reason why He can forgive you. You don't have to earn your way back into God's good graces. It's all about what Jesus has done. And believing that sets you free to deal honestly with your own sin. It takes faith to repent, doesn't it? You're not going to repent if you don't believe Jesus is going to receive you. It takes faith to repent. And quite frankly, we have to repent of not trusting. You see how they're inter, intertwined inseparably. In 1 John chapter 2, very next verses, uh, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the foundation of our justification. It's that Jesus has finished the work. And so recognizing that, uh, justification is not just something that happened in the past, it's a daily benefit. And we need this every single day. You're justified, which means I continue to struggle with sin, the heat is still real, and and, and it's, it's a real struggle in my life, but Jesus is still at work in me, all right? He says, I write this that you may not sin. But if you do sin, and somewhere I came across this saying, we're not going to become sinless, but we can sin less. If we understand Christ at work in us. And when we do sin, Jesus is our advocate before the Father. That means He's our defense attorney. And He goes before the Father and He pleads our case. And the case is not, He didn't do it. And it's not, let Him off on a technicality. Nobody read Him as Miranda writes. His plea is, not even insanity, even though sin is insanity. His plea is justification. I have paid for it. He is our propitiation. He has satisfied the righteous requirements of the law and the wrath of God in our place. Yes, this man did sin, but I paid for it. Augustus' top lady wrote this hymn, Now why this fear and unbelief? Has not the Father put to grief His spotless Son for us? And will the righteous judge of men condemn me for that debt of sin now canceled at the cross? Complete atonement you have made, and by your death have fully paid the debt your people owed. No wrath remains for us to face. We're sheltered by your saving grace and sprinkled with your blood. This is our confidence because of justification. This is the cross, and it's vital that we understand this, that Christ has done it for us. And because He has done it for us, we then can do what God would call us to do. We're going to end right here uh, at the end of our session. We'll pick up and finish uh, the remaining information in a few moments. But uh, let's, let's pray quickly.